At just after 10.30 p.m. on Monday the 22nd of May 2017, a suicide bomber detonated an improvised device in an area known as the City Room, just outside the arena, which starts the link to Victoria Station. On this evening, around 14,000 people, mainly teenagers and family, had traveled from across the UK to attend a concert of Ariana Grande, which was just coming to an end. The foyer was busy with exiting concert goers, waiting family members and merchandise sellers. The bomb used was substantial, containing nearly 2,000 nuts and had a devastating impact. The bomb killed 22 people, most of which were children. Over 100 were physically injured and many more suffered psychological and emotional trauma. The paramedics treated many walking wounded in the city center, Hospitals in Greater Manchester treated people with serious injuries transported by the ambulance service, whilst others made their way to hospitals from around the wider region. The Manchester Arena attack was the deadliest in the UK since the London bombing of the 7th of July 2005. Although the Greater Manchester Resilience Forum had done many planned exercises, the events of the 22nd of May were something none of those involved had ever encountered before. This was a real world test of the plans and assumptions. Today on the podcast, my guest is John Fletcher. John has over 28 years experience as uniform manager in Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, working at strategic level of command within the service leading on work streams, developing and implementing policy and supporting the corporate planning process. A successful and respected officer across the emergency planning fraternity, John has a wealth of knowledge working in an array of public, private and third sector organisations. This includes the military and other non-governmental organisations, working in the fields of UK resilience, planning and operational delivery. Previously security cleared to national security check level, a member of the Emergency Planning Society, associate member of the Business Continuity Institute and a member of the Institute of Fire Engineers, John was also part of a three-year secondment to the National Fire Chiefs Council Resilience Assurance Team, developing, embedding and assuring national capabilities of the UK Fire Service. Across John's long career, he's done a lot of work around marauding terrorist attacks and also done a lot of work as an associate trainer with Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service on this very subject. The reason John has such a wealth of knowledge in this is because John was the lead Nilo in Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service at the time of the attack. As you're going to hear today, whilst he himself was not the on-duty Nilo, he was immediately called in to assist the senior leadership team from a strategic and tactical perspective. And today we're going to go through exactly what happened on that night of the 22nd of May 2017. We're going to be speaking about the Manchester Arena Inquiry, that's volume two, the emergency response. We're going to talk about the nature of the inquiry. We're going to talk about Greater Manchester's initial response and start to unpick some of that fog of war and lack of clarity that seemed abundant for anyone that's read these reports. We mentioned things around Martin's Law, around Operation Plato. We talk about the civil contingencies regime. We speak a lot around JSIP, Joint Operating Principles and the Joint Doctrine. And you'll also hear us reference several times the Kurzlet Report, which was an independent review into the preparedness for the emergency response to the Manchester Arena attack. Now, we provided links for both the Kurzlet Report and the Manchester Arena Inquiry. You can see them in the notes for this episode. And before we get started, I just want to thank once again John for coming on and sharing such great insight into what was a very, very challenging, confusing, and subsequently uncomfortable debrief of an incident that will loom heavy, both on the UK Fire and Rescue Services and certainly on Greater Manchester. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned. A lot of this you may have already read in the Arena Inquiries and the Kurzlet Report, but now you get a chance to hear what it was really like to be in the thick of it. This is kind of a live debrief. I know our debrief episodes are always very popular and we have plans and plenty of documents to do a lot more of those. But this is one of three that we have recorded where we're actually speaking to one of the individuals involved themselves. And I think that really brings a level of authenticity, of truth, and helps us understand some of the thought process, the logic, and the kind of decision path. Because when we look at these things in retrospect, we all think we'd have done different. We all perhaps roll our eyes and say, what happened? Everyone seems to be an expert in retrospect. 100% certainty is only available to us in hindsight, and we should all do well to remember that. So we're going to talk about a lot of different services, a lot of different organizations, a lot of different departments within those organizations today. But please note that none of that is done from a framework of apportioning blame to anyone, but just to help give this wider understanding of what really did happen. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you take a lot away from it. Be sure to check the notes. And if you want to reach out and make contact with John, you can do so there as well. So without further ado, thanks for coming back to the podcast. And it's my pleasure to introduce John Fletcher. I'll see you on the other side. It was at 10 past 11 on the on the Monday night. Uh, I was off duty. I'd just done, completed a, a, a weekend duty. Um, and I was just about going to bed and my work phone pinged 
Uh, and my wife said to me at the time, is that your, your phone or is it the work one? I said, oh, it's, it, it's the work one. And she said to me, don't don't open it. So anyway, I opened it and it was um, a WhatsApp. We had a, um, I was one of the National Trade Liaison Officers within, within the brigade. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. And uh, the uh, duty ACO, um, Dave Keelan, text any update and there was a, um, um, just a hyperlink to a Sky News report. So I opened it and it just said, um, police are asking people to stay away from uh, Manchester City Centre. There's been a, uh, a large explosion um, in, the, in the arena area. So I looked at it um, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I knew, I, well, I knew the, the procedures, they'd speak to the duty nilo. I knew the duty nilo was, he was one of the station managers, I was his, I was his line manager. So I rang, I rang the nilo, duty nilo up, I said, uh, well, what's this? And he went, oh, and I could hear him, he was in the car, and I could hear the, blue, the sirens and blue lights going. He said, oh, it's, it's a bomb, it's uh, an active shooter, it's the lot. And I, I went, well, I've not seen anything about active shooter or anything. He said, no, it's an active shooter. And you could hear, the, you could hear, I sort of, I wouldn't say distress in his voice, but you know, the urgency in his, uh, in his voice. Just prior to the arena, within the, within the jobs, I keep referring to the jobs document, it mentioned that uh, police will instigate a three-way uninterrupted communication uh, link. And we always ask the question, well, what, what is it? And exactly what you just said, is it, is it a bat phone in the corner that, that, that goes to? Is it a radio channel? Things have moved on since the arena. This is one of the um, the lessons. But prior to it, we 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 done. Um, and again, I'll, 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 if you want to go back, to, I'll talk about an exercise that took place, which was a big, significant um, part about the um, the inquiry. Twelve months earlier, which involved special forces at um, a location in uh, in Manchester, which didn't go well. Um, and we put some training, we, we looked at it, we, did, we put some training, some awareness training for officers and we, we did three sessions and as it happened, there was a, um, we, we got requested to take part in a, a counter-terrorism tabletop exercise. There was a number of these taking places in the country that was funded by um, the counter-terrorism unit. Um, we had one in Manchester and we held it in the, I think it was the back end of March or early April of 2017. And this was this issue was brought up. Well, what what does it look like? I got the basically at the same time as the chief. I walked in the uh, uh, the building uh, with him at the time, and as I was going out, I said, "Are you not going to um, force headquarters? There's going to be an SCG, Strategic Coordinating Group meeting, at some point." I told him I'd already mobilised. Asked ask for an ILO to go up there, so I had an ILO um, available, and he he just said, "Well, I'll go when the they call the SCG." I went, well, right, okay then. And then he said, I've, I've asked an ACO to come in as well. I said, we'll send the ACO to, up to headquarters. And he said, no, I'll, de I'll, I'll decide who's going when they call it. Now, again, in his defence, we were expecting probably an SCG to be called relative, relatively quickly. I think, I think the meeting was held at half four in the morning. And again, that's one of the, the, the criticisms that came out of the, the report. And that's a, a strategic coordinating group will, will invariably form when a major incident has been, has been declared. Again, another learning point from this is the major incident wasn't declared until one o'clock in the morning. It was an oversight. Um, that, and the police accepted that as, as, as one for them. I got the, basically at the same time as the chief, I walked in the, uh, uh, the building uh, with him at the time. And as I was going out, I said, are you not going to um, force headquarters? There's going to be an SCG, Strategic Coordinating Group meeting at some point. I told him I'd already mobilised, asked ask for an ILO to go up there. So I had an ILO um, available. And he, he just said, well, I'll go when they, they call the SCG. I went, well, right, okay then. And then he said, I've, I've asked an ACO to come in as well. I said, well, send the ACO to, up to headquarters. And he said, no, I'll, dec I'll, I'll decide who's going when they call it. Now, again, in his defence, we were expecting probably an SCG to be called relative, relatively quickly. I think, I think the meeting was held at half four in the morning. And again, that's one of the, the, the criticisms that came out of the, the report. And that's a, a strategic coordinating group will, will invariably form when a, a major incident has been, has been declared. Again, another learning point from this is the major incident wasn't declared until one o'clock in the morning. It was an oversight, um, that, and the police accepted that as, as, as one for them. The conversation that was that was being had at the time, 
Um, we said like send the send the NTA down. Um, but anyway, he, he made the, the decision made, and as they driving off the yard, um, the Nilo who's now at, at Force Headquarters comes on the radio and said, "Police have declared Operation Plato." So we're saying right. So we then think this is twenty past twelve. We're now thinking right. We've been told there's an active shooter. Bombs gone off. Plato's now been declared. Um, it, it, it's an active shooter, and it's been declared at twenty past twelve. But what we didn't realise until about half an hour later, when there's information that Plato was actually declared at uh, ten forty-seven, um, and it wasn't passed on. Obviously, Plato is um, the only only the police can declare it, um, and it is a confirmed. Um, terrorist attack involving the marauding um, element. So at the time it was a marauding firearms terrorist attack. Op Plato has been has been declared. Um, now since the uh, the arena, it can obviously involve, um, like I say, the, the less sophisticated types of of weaponry, um, and there's a, an element now that. Once you know that it's not, and again, when you look at the arena, the arena wasn't um, an opto, it was, it was a, the bomb, bomb had gone off and it was dealing with the consequence of a, of a mass casualty, mass fatality um, incident at, at, at that time. So there was, yeah, you, you can't rule out that there's no secondary devices there, but the, the, the MTA or MTFA element has, 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 uh, has gone. They got to uh, got to the arena, I think it's like 20 to one in the morning. And by that time, I think, all the critically injured had been um, moved. They, they were, at, if, if there was anybody still there, they were at a casualty um, clearing point. Uh, but there were still things to do. You know, there was quite a lot of um, the, the walking wounded there. There was a, another request. We sent further uh, resources down to the scene. Um, but then I, I got a, a, a call off one of the nylons on scene, you know, and, and that's when they say, you know, there's a lot of anger here now um, with the uh, with the crews. Um, you know, they've, they've got the most of the, I'd say, the, the, the critical phase. There, there was still things ongoing. There were still things for them to do. When we was in the command support room, so we started setting that up at, we are going at 10 to 12, 5 to 12. And one of the things you always say about Sky TV, the TV, couldn't get the TV on for some reason. Um, I don't know whether it was on the, the wrong, you know, you sometimes you get it on the wrong HDMI thing or, or what have you. Um, anyway, I think it was about 10 past 12, one of the one of the officers actually got it on and, and we just all saw on the thing, all these ambulances going in and we, it, it was just like, the, the room just went silent. It was, oh my God. And I, you know, I just thought, God, we're, we're gonna get crucified here. The nylon was 22 miles away in certain decisions that were made um, and the chair of the inquiry actually said when he was doing his, his summing up the day the report was released um, and he knows about the anger of, of the, uh, the operational crews and he, he said you know it's, it's quite one thing um, putting people at risk when you know you're there or putting yourself at risk to put somebody at risk when you're miles away is something completely uh, different, and uh, you know that's absolutely right. And people do need to um, to think about that. It's you know, uh, yeah. You know, I, I was a firefighter for uh, many years, been into burning buildings myself. You know, uh, you do your own personal risk assessment. I've been a, a watch officer where you, you know you, you've got a, a view of things in there. You make decisions to send crews in. But when you're miles away and you've got an incomplete picture and, you, and you basically you're dealing with the, the worst incident that you, you could possibly imagine you're, and, and the information's incorrect that you've got a bomb, you've got an active shooter, you've, we saw what happened in Paris, you know, are we going to then send crews in based on the information that we've got? It, it's, a, it's a horrible, horrible dilemma um, to be in. Um, so what you've done, you've just focused everything on us. I said, you know, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not being... Facetious in. Well, this is a report into the emergency services. I said it says plural response, not the fire service. I said, no, as you read it, it's, you know, not some good things about the the, the other agencies. Um, but I, I raised with him about um, the Plato declaration of Plato um, that wasn't passed on to us, um, the lack of communication, and I, he said to me, as his, his, his answer was, well, you you, you know you should have known that the force duty officer 
we'll be overwhelmed. You know, you, you, you should have had a plan B. I said, well, I, I agree that we, sh we possibly should have had a plan B, but it was quite clear that plan A wasn't fit for purpose. You know, if you put a, if you put a weighting of responsibility on that, and, and again, I'm not trying to have a go at, at other agencies and slope shoulders, I said, but 80% of that is on the police and 20% on us, and yet you're focusing on, on, on us. The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognise, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, tablets, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders and please head over to our patreon page and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast please finally hit that follow subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening and wherever you're in the world please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening